Good morning, everyone. How is everybody doing today? It is a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Some of you are like, oh, the youth guy's up there. <laughs> Thank you for the one woo. Okay. Before we get into this, I just want to kind of recap um, a little things that we've been having going on. Uh, two weeks ago, or a week and a half ago, I haven't slept enough the past two weeks to tell you, but we closed, we wrapped up youth camp. We had uh, our middle school, they went to camp, we went to Camp Victory, it was an awesome time. And then we got back, was it Friday night, Saturday morning, three-ish? A few days ago, 18 hours ago, whenever it was, we got back from conference. We took 11 high, or middle schoolers and we took six high schoolers to camp and to conference. And we have a very short, it's one minute long, we're gonna watch a short little slideshow kind of what went on and pay attention to the last two. These are videos of praise and worship at conference and they don't even do it justice to what it was like. Okay, it was awesome. Camp we had, like I said, we took 11 students. We had one salvation, praise the Lord, that was worth going, that was worth the bug bites, the sunburns, the dehydration, the heat stroke, it was worth it all. Had several rededications, we had several that were baptized in the Holy Spirit. So yeah, that is a huge. And I tell you what, watching those middle schoolers pursue Jesus with everything they have is awesome to watch. It is a very humbling place to be in, to watch your kids. And parents, thank you so much for your trust in letting us take your kids to go have these encounters with God. And as far as conference goes, you guys saw those last two videos. Church, we have a big brother church that's going through a season right now. But that did not stop the Holy Spirit from showing up and impacting over 3,500 students' lives. 35, I think it was 3,581 was the number I heard. Students showed up, and I tell you what, I have never seen worship like that. They worshiped at the throne with complete and total abandoned, not caring what their best friend thought, not caring what somebody over here thought, they left it all out there on the altar. And it was awesome to see. And before we get to what I really need to talk about, I do want to honor a couple of people. Patrick, Cheyenne, Zane, wherever Zane's at, he's somewhere, he's probably in kids. You guys show up on Wednesdays to pour in these kids' lives. I pay you with questionable food sometimes. Um, and you guys are there to impact these kids' lives without you guys helping and volunteering and being there. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> to my wife, who said yes to this journey two years ago to step in, thank you. Been around PT too much. I can't keep it together at times. <clears throat> okay, but one thing I do want to note before we get to the sermon is Holly and I kept discussing when we were at conference. There were so many young men, and the women, the young ladies too, you guys worshiped. But I noted, and Holly noted, that the young men 
were on their knees, laying face down in front of the throne, weeping, crying in repentance and joy and being set free. There were young men in the bookstore praying over each other, didn't care that there were 60, 75 people around them. They didn't care. They were carrying their Bibles around, reading scripture over one another. For the generation that's above me, that thinks that this world is lost, it is. It is dark. But that lets our light shine brighter. This generation coming up, you guys have a calling, you have a purpose, you have a destiny to bring reformation and revival to this world to the likes that we have never seen. Okay, now what I'm actually here for after that's over. As we just said, we wrapped up camp, we've wrapped up conference, we've wrapped up VBS, we've wrapped up revival with Brother Jimmy that was absolutely phenomenal. And kids are leaving Wednesday to go to camp. This June, did we get extra days in June? How did all this stuff fit? I'm exhausted but encouraged at the same time. This has been for our church to walk in through this, and it is so awesome to see from the, little, the young kids all the way through our more seasoned members. We've all had opportunities to grow, to be challenged, to be encouraged, to be fed, to be pushed beyond what we normally would because we took these moments, these opportunities, and we said, yes, we'll be there, we will go. And it doesn't mean that you can't have them on Sunday morning. Please don't misunderstand me. But this morning, I believe that God has a word for us coming out of this month, out of these moments, these encounters, these camps, conferences, whatever they are. And I think that is really awesome that as a church, we could walk through all of this together. When we come out of big events like this, when we come out of camp, when we come out of conference, when we come out of revival, you get what the teens call a camp high. You get a bump, you're encouraged, you're built up, this feeling you're on cloud nine that nothing can stop you. And that feeling lasts for a day, two, maybe a week, maybe a month, and then back to normal. We're back into the routine of life. Life keeps happening. We're facing things that if we allow it, if we are, those thoughts are allowed to continue, they will steal your joy, your peace, your patience, and try to steal what God did for you back here, he'll try to steal it over here. If he can't distract you on the front, he will distract you on the end. He will try to steal, kill, and destroy everything that God has done. Sometimes the very areas that we just worked out come under attack. You know we have an enemy that loves nothing more than to see you miserable, broken, sad, despondent, and all by yourself, thinking that you're the only one. He hates it when we get freedom. He despises it that we can walk in joy and peace and freedom in a fallen world that he is supposed to be in charge of. But when we operate in the kingdom of God, we are taken out of the kingdom of this world. We are walking in authority, we are walking in freedom, and he hates it. And he will do anything that he can to pull you back in. So the question then becomes, how do we do, what do we do? How do we stand up to this? How do we keep the ground that we gained? How do we protect the freedom that was given to us? First, we need to see where the battle's actually taking place. If you have your Bibles this morning, if you have your U version, go to 2 Corinthians 10.3. 2 Corinthians 10.3. Jot this down if you take notes. 2 Corinthians 10.3. For we walk in the flesh, we do not accord war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. Everybody say that, mighty in God. Mighty in God, not mighty in me. Mighty in God. 
for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. The first thing that we have to do when we come out of these encounters with God, we have to learn that we need to fight, point number one, jot this down. We need to fight on the right battlefield. We need to fight on the right battlefield. It's so easy for us to get distracted by the environment that we live in. It's so easy to succumb to what is happening in our world that we don't fight the right battles. It's easy to look at the world through the lens of politics, of culture, that we don't see it through the lens of the Bible. We don't see the lens of what's really taking place behind the scenes in realms that we cannot even see. Sometimes we need to shift our perspective to see where those arrows are actually coming from. We need a different vantage point. We need to step back and move over here. It's not the person over here that, that we're battling against. It's not this group of people or that group of people. We all have an enemy that would love to see nothing more than to undo everything that God has done. We do not fight according to the way the world fights. We do not bend our knee to the things of this world that exalt itself against the knowledge of God. Amen. We do not. Amen. But, and I love this, PT said this uh, in one of his messages a while back, when we take that thought captive, it's not just thought go away. The verbiage of that is to take it by spear point, to hold that thought down. And if it does not align itself with the word of God, it is not fit to pick back up then it must flee because you're holding that weapon, you're holding it down at spear point. It must flee because you cannot afford to keep that thought in there because it is not of God. Yes. Steal, kill, and destroy. Do not let the enemy steal what God has done. So many times Christians seem worn down, tired, haggard, worn out, and they're just done. They're done. And sometimes it's because we're trying to do it on our own. Part of fighting on the right battlefield is fighting from the right vantage point. We don't fight on our own, on our own strength of our own accord, of our own will, of our own might, because all of that fails. When you try to muscle through and do it by sheer willpower, it'll last for a moment. We have to get out of the mindset that our victories come from our strength and into an understanding that God has fought the battle already. He is fighting on our behalf. That war has already taken place. That war is over. It's just the little skirmishes that he is still fighting and putting out on our behalf if we submit to him and follow what he has set aside for us. We have brothers and sisters that will stand there with us when we're under attack and they will fight with us. We're not designed to do this on our own. Now, we're gonna shift just a second. We're gonna talk about a D word, Ethan, not junior high humor, not that D word. Discipline. Mm, nobody likes that word. Nobody likes discipline. Kids don't like it in school. Adults, adults don't like it because sometimes we have authority issues. We just don't wanna do it sometimes because we don't want to. It makes me cringe a little bit, but it's something that is needed. First Corinthians 9.24, if you'll turn there with me. First Corinthians 9.24. We're gonna read verses 24 through 27. And Paul will make you feel really good about discipline here. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs? Everyone runs, not some run. In the race, everybody that's racing has to run. That's kind of how the race works. But only one person gets the prize. So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we, we do it to win an eternal prize. 
So I run with purpose in every step. I am not shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that at preaching to you, I myself might be disqualified. Church, point number two, if you take notes, and I like this word, don't shirk away from discipline. Shirk is to deflect, to avoid, to get out of the way of. We all do that. It's our natural instinct. It's the sinful part of us, the human nature part of us. We don't want to be disciplined. We want to do what we want. This is not the funnest of topics, but Paul relates it to an athlete. Everybody looking at me? I'm not one. That waved bye-bye a long time ago. Used to be one, but that's a story of for a different day. Don't want to rabbit trail down that. Paul tells us that we need to run to win. Athletes put their body through the pain of practice, through the pain of training, to work to achieve a goal. And I, I got to thinking the other day, how much do professional athletes put in? How much do they work? Professional athletes, on average, spend two to three hours a day training. And everybody's like, whoa, hey, a two to three hour job for 0.47% of the population? I can get on that. That two to three hours a day is six days a week on top of the practice that they play with their team and on top of the conditioning they're already doing for their sport that they're in. The two to three hours is what they put in behind the scenes that nobody sees. That's when they're in the gym with just one light on shooting three after three after three. That's the quarterback throwing pass after pass after pass for accuracy. That's the weightlifter working in his home gym, just tearing those muscles down so they can be rebuilt again. That's what goes on behind the scenes. Caitlin Clark does not, is not a phenomenal athlete. She is a very gifted person, but it's the work that goes in behind the scenes that nobody sees, that nobody knows, that makes her as good as she is. And Paul tells us that he does that. If Paul needed training, if Paul needed training, Paul, he wrote a third of this part. How much more do I need training? How much more work do I need to put in behind the scenes, hitting my knees, opening that word, fellowshipping with other believers? If Paul needed it, I do too. Grace and forgiveness are free. They are. God gives those, extends those to us free of charge, no strings attached. But church, we have work to do. God can't read the Bible for you, to you, so you understand it. God doesn't use your, I don't wanna, I don't know where that was going with that one. <laughs> God intercedes for us, but he can't use our lips to pray for about a need. Oh, time and time again, it says, let your, be, let your needs be made known to God. We have work to do. We have a part in this. We have to partner with him and allow him to work through us, for us, for his good and his glory and his church, not just because we want something or need something, but because he wants to use you in your situation for his kingdom and his goodness. We have to stand guard against the wiles of the devil. We must not give up the ground that God has won for us. We cannot let the freedom that we experience be traded back for captivity and bondage. We often, I often read in Exodus, children of Israel, they're crying out because the taskmasters of Egypt are cruel. They work them hard, they work them to death, they beat them. Moses comes in, God delivers his people. They get into the wilderness for two days and like, man, Egypt looks pretty good. I was worked like a dog, beaten like a rented mule, but I had garlic to put on my bread. How many of us whine and complain about the position that we're in and we think that Egypt starts to look good rather than running towards the promised land and running through the pain? 
A high price was paid for each and every one of you. Should that not be shrugged, should that be shrugged off to go back to what I got set free from? No, run with purpose in every step. Paul says that he disciplines himself like an athlete. So how do we discipline ourselves? Submitting to God, building our faith. There's really no dynamic recipe. How do we do these things? How do we submit to God? How do we build our faith? How do we draw closer? Prayer, word, fellowship. Very simple, basic stuff that we seem to overlook because sometimes we want a hyper-spiritualized answer that's gonna do the work for us. You wanna see things change? Bring them to God. You wanna be encouraged? Read your Bible. I fail, there's people that failed worse than I did in my eyes, so I'm gonna read that. I'm gonna be built up because if God can use an imperfect person in the Old Testament, New Testament, he can do it in me. Amen. Once a week is not enough to read the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We have got to get back to reading our Bible, whether physical, you version, whatever it is, pick up the word and get in it. We need others to encourage us. Hebrews 10.25 says, do not forsake the for, uh, gathering of the assembly. We need others, whether we're a people person or we're antisocial, whether we're neurodivergent, whatever it is, we need people in our lives to encourage us, build us up, pray for us, and help us along the race that we are in. Amen. And we need to be that for somebody else. It's not just about us, it's about everybody sitting in this room. Grab somebody's hand and drag them along the finish line with you. We are not to be sniper Christians. We cannot afford to go it alone. If you know more about the con a content, con I'll spittle out the right words in a second. If you know more about a content creator on the TikTok, yeah, the, the TikTok, I'm old and I can use that. If you know more about a content creator than you know about the gospel, you have a problem. If you know more about a pop star who sings over and over and over about these horrible relationships that she put herself in, over and, and you know every word, every song, but you don't know about the relationship that you have with Jesus Christ, you need to readjust what you're doing with your time. If you know more about statistics of your favorite player, you know there's statistics from high school and college and into the pros, you know every RBI of your favorite team, but you don't know if Jude comes before Malachi or before Revelation, you need to study the right thing. It is time to get off the sidelines and get into the game that we have been called to be in. I'm not saying any, this to anyone to make you feel bad or make you feel shameful, but we have got to focus on what is really important in this life. Yes. This life is but a breath, yes. and we only know one date of it when we were born. There are people out there that only you can reach. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. We cannot afford to be slumbering, to be sleepy, to be lazy. There is a lost and hell-bound world out there that need you. Good. Only you can reach those that only you can reach. I don't know the friends that you have. I don't know the people that you associate with. Only you can reach the people that you know. I can't plant the seeds for you. Pastor Terry can't plant the seeds for you. A farmer doesn't go to a random field and sow seed in it. He goes to his field to produce the crop that he needs, that it will multiply and grow. Only you can plant the seeds that you can plant. Only you can encourage those that you can encourage because I don't know everybody that Larry knows. Larry can go out and have an impact on 20 people that I don't even know their name. Now, Back to our, we're shifting back to what we were talking about at the beginning. How do we keep this? I have a story for you, and it's about two animals. 
And it's real, it's true. I saw it on the Facebooks. Thanks, Catherine, by the way, for sharing it. And in these, this story, it's about two animals. The first one, how many of y'all own cows? Does anybody own cows or you have owned cows in the past? Okay, there's a, hand, there's a couple, there's a couple. I have a few. And anybody that's been around these animals, I've been around them my entire life, they're not very bright. They are not intelligent. I mean, they know t- they, they need water, they need food, they need sleep. That's the extent of the knowledge that's in there. And they will test your flesh like no other creature. When a storm is coming, when a storm is rolling in, I don't know how they sense it because again, not very sharp. When a storm comes in and you see this more in open range scenarios or giant fields, cows run. They're trying to get away from the storm. They're trying to get away from what is coming. And sometimes the cow will run itself to death. And if they don't die, they are in the storm longer than they could have been if they wouldn't have started running around all over the place. They run backwards, forwards, to and fro, away from the storm, back into the storm, through the storm, sideways, in every which direction. Now you look at the American bison, the buffalo. When they sense a storm is coming, they don't act like the lowly, derpy cow. They herd up, and they charge head on into that storm. Because instinctively, somehow in that oversized head of theirs, it's gigantic. In that brain of theirs, God put some type of survival instinct inside of them to run into the storm because if they run into the storm, they're gonna reduce their exposure. They're gonna reduce the amount of pain that is inflicted by running through it. Because if they get through it quicker, they have a better survival rate. They know if they get through that storm, Now I have a question for you guys. Do you want to be a cow? (laughs) I found the derpiest picture of a cow I could possibly find. But this sums up the majority of cows when they're just standing there. Or do you wanna be the bison? I saw this picture a few years ago and I love this picture. Now, personally, I don't want to be that bison because that looks very cold. No. I don't want to be either if I can avoid it. There's a fundamental truth to the behavior of the bison. When we are faced with what, allowing what God has done for us to be etched away, what do we do? Do we just continue to allow it to happen? Let the lies of the enemy steal what God has done, our choices and decisions to be influenced by those things? Or do we stand and fight and run through that storm? Don't give up a single toll hold to the enemy. Stand and fight. The sooner we put on the armor of God and use the weapons that he gave us, prayer, his word, fellow believers to partner with and taking thoughts captive, the sooner we'll come out of the other side of it. Charge head on into what you are facing. Don't shirk away from it. Don't try to shuffle it off. Stand and fight. Stand and fight. Again, this is not something that we do on our own strength, but by relying on a good father who wants to see his kids succeed. How many parents are in here? Please raise your hand if you have kids, adult, doesn't matter. How many of you want them to go farther than you ever went, to be successful, to be a... God-fearing man or woman in their life and raise godly kids. We want our kids to go farther than we did, to succeed, to win, and not win for pride or crowns that will wither, but we want to see them succeed. If we want that in our imperfect love, how much more does God want to see you in his perfect love, to see you succeed, to see you set free, to see you moving in the direction and to the calling and to the vision and the purpose that God has just for you? In Isaiah 50, we see some messianic prophecies about Jesus. Hundreds of years before Jesus came, Isaiah started writing things down that God spoke to him. Some of these were about what he would face, and this is one of those. But this scripture has always stuck out to me. 
Isaiah 50, verse 7. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. Point number three is set your face like flint. Well, how does that apply to me? This was talking about Jesus. He was our perfect example, the one we should imitate and strive after. If he had to set his face like flint, the Christ, the Messiah, if he had to set his face like flint and walk in determination, the path that's set before him, don't you think I need to do the same? As we begin to close this morning, here in just a moment, I'm gonna ask each of you to be honest with yourself, honest with where you're at, Ask the Holy Spirit to search your heart. Is there ground that you have given up? Are there things that you've been set free from that you're starting to flirt with again? Pick it back up just a little bit. Is there something that you need to get out of your way? Is there something that's keeping you from distract, it's keeping you distracted? Maybe we need to put ourselves through a little pain of discipline. Are we too caught up in the different lenses of the world to, to see that all the societal and cultural issues going on in our world are a spiritual issue at their heart? Church, we need to hit our knees. We need to pursue God with complete and total abandon. The last scripture of this morning is Ephesians 6.10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, not your armor, God's armor, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in that evil day. And having done all, to stand. Pastors use three points. You get a bonus. Point number four. Stand, stand your ground. Stand where God has planted you. Stand in the freedom that he has given you. Stand in the blessings and the abundance that he has bestowed upon you and do not let that be taken. Amen. Now speaking of stand, if everybody would please rise to your feet. Church, we don't like fight against flesh and blood, political parties, pop culture. We don't. Those are symptoms of a spiritual issue. Political party is not gonna save us. Jesus Christ did that 2,000 years ago. That does not mean that we don't boldly proclaim the truth of God, show the love of God, show the truth of his word. We still stand, we stand firm, we will not compromise what this book says. But we have to proclaim liberty to the captives. Like John the Baptist, John the Baptist realized, I must decrease so Jesus can increase. If John, cousins with Jesus, baptized Jesus, if John had to decrease, how much more of me do I need to get out of the way? We have a real enemy that we need to fight against. We have an enemy that wants to see you broken, miserable, and lonely. We have, fight, we have got to fight the right battles, walk in discipline and set our faces like flint. And having done all that, at the end of me, at the end of where I am is where God begins. And I can stand in that. As you stand here this morning, the praise team is going to lead us in one last song. And as I said a bit ago, take this moment, be honest with yourself, Pray a bold prayer, God, search my heart. And if there's anything not of you in me, get it out of there. There's gonna be a team up here to pray with you, to partner with you, to love on you. If you have any need whatsoever, come right up here.